Shane, think yourself out of this one. Jasper will have that door down in just another second. There'll be nothing between you and his sort of shotgun but air. Think fast, Shane, because... Uh... The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman, back at his old haunts in New Orleans. Another transcribed episode. We call it The Case of the Phantom Gun. Yes? Oh, Mr. Shane, come on in. I wasn't expecting anybody. I'll only be a minute. I just stopped by to tell you I finished your job. You. You found out? Yep. Well, is this... No, Mrs. Kinney, your husband isn't seeing another woman on the night she stays away from home. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shane. I'm just... What are you doing? I suggest you keep him home nights. Mr. Shane, what do you mean? Look, you hired me to find out if he's running around with another woman. Well, I found out he isn't. Now, Mrs. Kinney, if you don't mind, I... Well, the way you're evading it, I... Well, you just can't walk out on me. If Dick is in some sort of trouble, I... Oh, I should always follow my hunches. Look, uh, I didn't want your case in the first place, but you looked like a good kid, and I didn't like the idea of some guy pushing you around. Well, I... I don't understand. I've only been on the case three days, Mrs. Kinney. But from the very beginning, I've been getting phone calls from a character who's been warning me they'd find my head in a basket if I didn't lay off. Uh, well, what could Dick be doing that would possibly... This morning. This morning, I couldn't get into my office with the stuff piled knee-high all over the place. Now, my furniture isn't exactly Chippendale, but it does have a sentimental value. And as for my files, they look like the morning after Mardi Gras. You're... Office was ransacked? Yeah, it looked more like the Ringling Brothers had used it as a detention room for naughty elephants. Well, certainly Dick had nothing to do with that. I'm not on any other case, Mrs. Kinney, and the gal who cleans up doesn't know any elephants. But I, I just don't understand. If Dick really is in trouble, why Look, is... can you understand me? Keep Dickie at home. But why? Why, Mr. Shane? All right. I'll tell you. Then it's your problem. Your husband has picked up an unsavory playmate. He's up to his clavicle in some very hot blackmail. And if I'm any judge, his clavicle is about to be chopped off. In a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Gun. <laughs> Recipe for trouble? Take one part shame, add a pretty young thing in trouble up to her ears through no fault of her own, mix well in a solution of tears, and you have a guy who let his emotions sway his good judgment. Something I do as often as a police commissioner that treats me to a steak dinner. A Phyllis Kinney had hired me to find out if her husband was too timely. He wasn't, but he'd gotten himself mixed up with a character named Jasper. This Jasper was following his usual routine, getting close to his blackmail victim by working for him. In this case, he was the gardener at the Duval estate. And that's how Dick Kinney got mixed up with him. Dick was the Duval chauffeur. What made it pretty clear something was in the air was what happened after I'd stuck my nose in there just briefly. I got threatening phone calls and a cyclone hit my office. Typical Jasper stunts. Anyway, I agreed to try talking some horse sense into young Dick Kinney before I bowed out of the case. It was getting dark when I pulled up outside the ancestral grounds of the Duval estate. I walked up the gravel driveway toward the house. Couldn't see a car anywhere in front, but there were lights on in the house, so chances were Dick was around back. Hello there. Uh, oh, hello. I haven't seen you before, have I? Mm. Mm, yourself. You'd remember if you had. Nice. Everything nice. Even the hair. Nice and red. You wouldn't be Mrs. Duval, would you? You read the society page. No, this was on the front page. Oh, that. Wasn't that nasty of them? 62 marrying 22, that kind of thing. I'm glad I'm 22. Come here. Yeah. Kind of impulsive, aren't you? I don't believe in stifling inhibitions. It's unhealthy, Mr. Shane. 
Did you come here to see my husband? No, I just want to work with Dick Kinney, your chauffeur. Dick? Oh. He's pretty, too. He's around back somewhere. Probably in the garage. Uh, going to stick around a while? No. Oh, too bad. I'll see you again, Mr. Shane. Goodbye. She ran off like the young animal she was. Disappeared into the house. When I got around to the back of the house, I saw a light burning in the four-car garage and walked in. Somebody in coveralls was working on a town and country. He must have heard me come in because he pulled his head out of the motor and looked up. A blonde, wavy hair, blue eyes, and a weak mouth matched the picture on Phyllis Kinney's mantle. I started to say, you're Dick Kinney, aren't When I saw Kinney's eyes get wide, I wheeled around, I caught a glimpse of an upraised arm, and then... Oh. fell in, plowed me under. And then I smelled gasoline. It was one big ache all over. I opened my eyes just in time to see the heel of a shoe come down to my face. And then it was nothing for a while. The smell of dust and blood, leather and blood and gasoline and blood crept back into my nose. I opened my eyes again. It was pitch dark. The roaring in my head blended with the low hum of the motor. I was on the floor of a car. We were driving somewhere. I jounced around like I was on a mechanical horse and out of time with the bucking. Then the car stopped. The door was open. I was yanked out by my ankles and my head bounced as it hit the ground. I waited for something to happen. It did. I didn't feel any new pains. I was lying in the grass and it was cold with a little dew on it. Maybe the shots weren't for me. You were told, Shane. You were told and you didn't behave. Now you're in the soup, but good. Jasper, I recognize your voice anyway. Would you, Shane? Maybe there'll be bells in your ears tomorrow, Shane. Maybe you won't hear so good. Are you making a mistake, Jasper? You're getting me interested. You oh, shut up. It felt like little taps. Till I tasted shoe leather in my mouth. Blood again. Then I didn't taste or smell or think anymore. <laughs> the moon was gone and I was cold. My face felt stiff and every bone in my body hurt. I got to my feet and looked around. It was pretty dark. I thought about my nice warm apartment. I thought it cheered me up a little. Then I saw him. It was the kid, Dick Kinney. He was lying on his stomach, face down. He wasn't breathing. I wondered briefly why I was still alive. Only it was too much of an effort. I wanted to lick my wounds and go to bed and sleep off the nightmare I'd just gone through. I kept telling myself as I started home, call headquarters, report the murder. But I don't think I did. Do a favor and get kicked in the teeth. I was so stiff the next morning, it took me five minutes to ease myself out of bed. I hobbled into my car and drove downtown, then hobbled up to my 10 by 14 office. I picked up a package the mailman had left with some circulars and bills and went inside. The cleaning woman had managed to make some sort of order out of the place. I eased myself into my chair, tossed the circulars and bills into the wastebasket, and turned to the package. It bore a New Orleans postmark, but no return address. I tore it open. It grinned up at me and seemed to say, Boy, are you stupid, Shane. It was a Colt 38, nice and clean and just oiled. I reached for the lower left-hand drawer of my desk, but I knew I was wasting my time. This was my gun. Yeah, empty. I hadn't checked it when I found my office torn apart. I thought, Shane, you're losing your grip. What's the angle? Not being knocked off last night, and then this. What's the build-up for? Well, I didn't have to wait for an answer. Hi, uh, Shane. Hello, Lieutenant. What happened to your face? I got a nervous barber. You want to take a little trip? No, I'm not up to it. Force yourself. And uh, that gun will take that along. What's up, Fletcher? A tip. And what? A kid was found shot to death this morning. Dick Kinney. Do you know him? Yeah, I heard of him. I had it in mind to call and report it. Yeah. Let's have a gun. Uh-huh. 38. 
Kinney was shot with a thirty-eight. Well, there were thirty-eights and thirty-eight. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go. This tip was pretty definite. <laughs> thing was going too fast for me. Maybe I was wrong all along. Jasper wasn't that kind of an operator. He hadn't messed with murder before, as far as I knew. Maybe I'd stepped into something at, at 38. Okay, Shane, let's talk. Did you test the gun? Yeah. Dick Kenny was killed with it. And I told you somebody swiped it from me. Yeah, yeah, you told me. But you didn't report it when it was stolen. I didn't know it was stolen. You didn't do better than that, Shane. Look, Lieutenant, I got it in the mail this morning. You said you were going to report the murder. You were with Kenny last night about 9 o'clock. I told you how it was. The marks on your face don't lie, Shane. But neither does ballistics. Two slugs and Kenny match with slugs from your gun. And the gun was nice and clean and just oiled. But I tell you, it was in the mail. It came in the first delivery. All right, Shane. Let's go back to your office and take a look at that wrapper. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now you're using your head, Lieutenant. Thanks. Okay, Lieutenant, I threw the wrapper right into the wastebasket here now. Oh, no. What? The cleaning woman must have emptied it out. Oh, no, okay, Shane, I think we've reached the end of this little... Oh, circus. wait, wait, we can try outside. Maybe they haven't picked up the trash yet. You uh, know that's against the law, littering the street like that. Yeah, yeah. Bend down and help me go through this stuff here. It's a brown wrapper. Okay. I don't know what this will prove anyway. All it can do is establish you getting a package this morning. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, let's see. Okay, Lieutenant, take a look at the postmark. And that's it. New Orleans, 3 p.m., April 12th. And that's yesterday afternoon, all right? Yeah. The package with my gun in it was mailed yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And I got it this morning at a quarter to nine. You know, Shane, ballistics is like fingerprints. No two of them alike. Then you made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake. Maybe you did. It just doesn't add up. It couldn't have been my gun that killed Kenny. The gun was in the United States mail at the time he was shot. That's what you say. How do I know your gun was in that package? But I'm telling you... All I know is that in the history of the police department, ballistics has never been wrong. You admit being with him when he was killed, your gun killed him. There's only one answer, Shane, and you're it. In a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Gun. I was in a spot and I talked fast. I'd taken a little case and it got away from me. Phyllis Kinney wondered whether her husband was spending his nights with other women after he got through with his chores as chauffeur for the Duvals. And because of I could use the fee, I looked into it. I found out he'd gotten chummy with a character named Jasper, who worked on the Deval estate as God. But Jasper's real trade was blackmail. I went to warn young Kenny to lay off and wound up with a headache. The kid was knocked off in an open spot on the bank of the Mississippi, and my gun apparently was a murder weapon. Only I didn't have the gun at the time. It was in the United States mails. Another item that kept my fat head in the fire was that I was along on the junket, albeit semi-conscious. Lieutenant Fletcher of the New Orleans homicide detail had a point. Look, Shane, the bullets that killed young Kenny came from your gun. You can't shake that. You say the gun came through the mail this morning and that it was in the mail since yesterday afternoon. I admit it doesn't add up, but Ballistics I'm... don't lie. You gonna book me? I'm considering it. What'll that get you? Look, I've got an idea. You can tell me your idea. Well, it's speculation. That's all it is. Now. We speculate fine downtown. Okay, Fletcher. If that's the way it is, I'm climbing up. We've been too easy on you guys. All we get is a swift... I don't know what you're complaining about. All I want to do is follow a trailer to wrap the whole thing up for you. All right, Shane. This is against my better judgment, but you've got just eight hours to find something. Thanks, Lieutenant. Just don't try to leave town. I might as well tell you, we're going right ahead, fitting your neck for a noose. <laughs> One thing I knew. One thing I was sure. That gun was in the mail when Kinney was shot. Like the lieutenant said, ballistics don't lie. No two bores make the same marks on a bullet. It's one in a hundred billion. It just doesn't happen. Whoever figured this out was a smart cookie. The first thing I wanted to do was speak to old man DeVal. Yes, Mr. Shane? Mr. DeVal? That's right. What can I do for you? It's what I can do for you. Oh, Who's putting a bite on you? I beg your pardon? Did you know your chauffeur, Dick Kinney, was shot last night? Yes. The police been here? I don't see what business that is of yours. I got my fingers burnt. I was taken along for the ride. Oh. And that reference to, uh, to, uh... Blackmail. You're a private detective. That's right. 
I don't understand your connection. I was checking up on Dick Kenny. For what? Something else. It uh, doesn't fit in with your problem. Uh, Mr. Shane, I'm rather busy. You're not too busy, Mr. Duval. Dick Kenny was blackmailing you, and Dick Kenny was killed last night. Go on, Mr. Shane. You want to tell me about it? Tell you? Tell you what? What the blackmail was about. It seems to me you've made a lot of suppositions. I don't know why you've got your information, but it doesn't resemble anything I am aware of. Well, okay, Mr. Duval. You've got a right to your own mistakes. Good day, Mr. Shane. Oh, uh, where's your wife? Good day, Mr. Shane. Shane, you're a whiz bag, you are. And Armand Duval is charming. And Judith, his sprightly wife, is ugly. And Lieutenant is full of milk and honey, and the character Jasper is sweetness and light. And you, Shane, are the brilliant, the distinguished man about town. Detective par excellence. Yeah, here you've been scouting the setup for four days. You had a seat on the 50-yard line. Even had your own head used as a football, and you still don't know the score. Oh, yeah, you're a sharp one. Now all you have to do is wait behind the potted petunias until the suspect plants his hoof print in the loam. Well, as I left the Duval Castle and started toward the back of the house to pay my respects to Jasper, Judith popped out from behind a weeping willow. You aren't leaving without uh, seeing me, Michael, were you? Well, leaving wasn't my idea. Your husband... Oh, yes. Yeah. Come on, Michael. There's a bench behind this willow tree. I'd like you to uh, know me better. That sounds like a worthy project. What's happened to you? Your face looks it like... It came out second best in a tussle with a toe of your gardener, size 11. Size but... 10 and a half, Shane. Ah, behind me again, huh? That's all right. Lift them. Jasper, what are you doing? Just checking, Mrs. Duval. <clears throat> uh, no gun, Shane? No gun. All the odds are with you again, Jasper. <laughs> yeah, I've been getting an idea, a swell idea. Yeah, you've had lots of them lately. Things are breaking my way for a change. Jasper, put that gun away. Ah, uh, uh, Mrs. Duval, this is the payoff. We're going to have an audience with the boss. Come on, both of you. Well, where'd you get that museum piece, Jasper? You like it? Just a shotgun. A little sawed off. Covers lots more territory that way. Let's go. What is this, Jasper? <laughs> little idea, sir. Everything was going so smooth and nice, I thought it's a pity if anything should happen. And then I thought this idea, I thought. And it's a pit. Mm. You got a gun? Yeah. Sit down, Mrs. Duval. I think you're making a mistake, Jasper. Mistake, mistake. I ain't made one yet, and I've been in the business a long time. I said, sit down. I refuse to have you. Uh, Jasper, you... Here we are, Shane. There you are. You're real brave with a gun. Judith. Judith. She's unconscious. That jabbering was getting on my nerves. What do you intend to do? (laughs) It's a perfect setup. Shane is going to take the rap. For what? For Kenny's murder, Shane. It's like you're going to take the rap for Duval's. Uh, you're going to kill me? Sure. You paid off Kenny five grand yesterday. That's chicken feed. Yeah. Now, Kenny was your go-between. That's why you bumped him. That's right, Shane. I don't like to think I got a split with anybody. Now, wait a minute, Jasper. We, we, we can come to terms, I'm sure. Uh-uh. This is too perfect. No. No, don't! <laughs> You are you mind, Shane? This is an easy way for me to take care of you. You got careless just one second too long. Besides, you made a mistake. My gun is at headquarters. But this one ain't. I knocked the gun out of his hand and it went skittering across the floor. But he was a lot closer to it than I was and on his way for it already. I thought he who fights and runs away and I slammed the door behind me and started for the front. I got lost or something, wound up in the kitchen. I went through it and out onto the rear veranda. I knew if I started across the lawn, I wouldn't have time to get to cover. I went back into the house through French windows with Jasper panning along behind me. Through the library and a big double-width staircase that led up to the top floor. I took it three at a time. Jasper was just rounding the first bend behind me when I reached the top. It splendid, the beautiful wall paneling, but I didn't stop to survey the damage. I turned right and disappeared into the master bedroom at the end of the hall, just as another shot spurred me on. The room was done up in purple and rose. I guess it was very pretty under different circumstances. There was a door at the far end, and I scooted into it and threw it shut behind me, and then I turned the lock. Bathroom. I didn't even have time to look for an aspirin tablet in the medicine chest when the hammering started. I said to myself, all right, Shane, keep your head. You got to think yourself out of this one. Because on the other side of that door, Jasper's waiting for you. And the way that door is splintering up now, it doesn't look as if the wood is as stout as you're craving to keep on living. 
Gotcha, Shane. Gotcha. He'd squinted out the middle panel. Now his hand filled the hole and the gun filled his hand. Any second... <laughs> didn't feel anything. Maybe you never do. Maybe it was all over. Then the fingers of Jasper's hand got limp and... The gun fell onto the tile floor. I opened the door. It was Judith DeVal. She stood in the center of the room and a thin thread of dried blood was on her chin. And the gun in her hand was pointed at Jasper, curled up on the floor. In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. the bullets and Armand Deval came from your gun also, Shane. That's what I thought, Lieutenant. But your gun's been in my desk all afternoon. Just like last night when Dick Kenny was shot. My gun was in the mail. You got a theory? Sure. Well? I think you killed Deval. Huh? Oh, you slay me, Shane. <laughs> Did you inspect that sawed-off shotgun? Yeah, the boys are going over it now. Why? And I told you my office was ransacked and my gun was stolen. What was to prevent Jasper from firing a half a dozen bullets into some pillows, cleaning the gun, and sending it back to me? Nothing if he wanted to. Sure he'd want to. If he figured on putting those bullets in a gadget that would fit into the chamber of the shotgun and hold the bullets, yeah. then he could fire them through a much larger bore than my thirty eight. Yeah, hey, that would work, wouldn't it? The bore of a shotgun is so large that it wouldn't mark up the bullet. Yeah, and would leave the original rifling marks from my gun. The only reason Jasper didn't finish me off last night was because he figured I'd take the rap for Dick Kinney's murder. Yeah, that makes sense, too. I wouldn't have had a close shave this afternoon if I'd ever learned to keep my big mouth shut. I told Jasper my gun was in police headquarters after he killed DeVal. Then he realized what I should have thought of, that I couldn't be framed for DeVal's killing through my gun. That's why he went after me. And hey, where are you going? I got a little unfinished business. I'll be back. It was pretty simple when you knew the background. Jasper got a job as a gardener because he wanted to be close to his blackmail victim, Duval. He'd got Dick Kinney to front for him and then killed the boy so he wouldn't have to split. It all tied together that way. All except one little item. I was going to find out about that. Judith was waiting for me in the Duval library. Mike. Oh, Mike. Now, before we settle down and get comfortable, sweetheart, I got a little confession. What do I care what you want to confess? Oh, Mike, it's going to be wonderful. Just you and me. Now, this confession's about you. Uh, all right, what? What is it? I thought for one solid three-minute period you were true blue and a yard wide. Hmm? When you shot Jasper. Now, it wasn't so much to save my life, sweetheart, as it was to get rid of him. Tell me, did Jasper pick you or did you pick Jasper? Mike, what are you talking that about? That gun trick. It's way over Jasper's head. He could never think of a thing like that. Oh, let's not talk about Jasper. And why would Jasper kill your husband if he's the one who was being blackmailed? Was he, Mike? No, dice, baby. What are you thinking? It's pretty clear, Judith. You put Jasper up to getting money from your husband. And Jasper saw a wonderful opportunity. He didn't have to nibble at Duval. He wanted half of the money all at once. As Duval's widow, you get the money, don't you? Mike. Maybe he'd even bleed you to death for the other half, too. He was sitting pretty until everything fell into place for you. Mike, listen. There are wonderful things from now on. I've got money. We can have all the good things. We can enjoy them, darling, together. Yeah. Let's go, baby. Where? Where to, Mike? Police headquarters. This is where I came in. I always meet the right woman at the wrong time. I figured that tied everything up. But not quite. It turned out that the blackmail angle had to do with Duval not having a final divorce from his first wife when he married Judith. Judith was the only one who knew it. She contacted Jasper and worked him in on the deal. Very cute. Because when that came out, Judith lost her right to Duval's millions. But then, what could she spend money on where she was going? The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure in mysterious and colorful New Orleans. Uh...